In today's lecture, what I want to do is take all of the things we've been learning in Unit 3 and put them together in a way that will help us understand why this kind of thing is important. What I want to do is to focus on a particular disease. And I'm going to introduce a character. Her name is going to be Mary. Uh, that's not her real name, but she is a real person. She's gone through a particular clinical problem that I want to address here. Now, Mary is a 43-year-old mother. She has three kids. Uh, and what's sort of definitive in her case is that she was a cigarette smoker since she was 19. And she was kind of on, and on again, off again, apparently, from the, from the uh, physician's notes. But basically, she considered herself a light smoker um, because she had talked about her father. And her father was a smoker all his life. And she said that she didn't smoke anywhere near as much as he did. And she also talked about her uncle, and her uncle was 65, and he'd always smoked, and he was still alive, and so on. Um, he'd apparently been in, in uh, uh, one of the wars, Second World War, or Vietnam, I can't remember, remember which. But the fact of the matter is, she is trying to rationalize uh, something here. And this is a very common thing that uh, people often do uh, when they are suffering from something or ha have been scared by uh, something that's occurred to them clinically. So what's definitive is not that kind of thing. What's definitive in her case is the fact that she had developed a persistent cough. And by persistent, it means it just never goes away. It doesn't seem to get better. In fact, it's continually getting worse. Uh, the cough is often in the uh, morning, uh, but it also continues through the day. Now, she's a smoker. That's a common thing among smokers to have a, a smoker's hack or cough, uh, really loud cough that occurs typically in the morning until all the phlegm that gets built up uh, is, is freed. In her case, this was different. It continued throughout the day and it hurt. And there were times when she would cough really hard and it would bring up a kind of a yellow, gooey uh, kind of a sputum. And sometimes it had blood in it, tinged with blood. Um, oddly enough, she did not go to the doctor. Uh, the physician at that time, she continued uh, trying to convince herself that she was okay and everything was going to be fine. What brought her to the doctor was recently she had developed these tremors apparently in her, in her left hand and she couldn't control them. Uh, she had no control over them. They would occur sort of at random times and she often would get lightheaded, dizziness. She'd get a headache, uh, especially in the morning. She would stand up and, and uh, walk around for a while and often the headache would resolve. And all of those symptoms, the cough, the yellow sputum, the blood in it, the tremors in the hand, headaches in the morning that resolve later, uh, are indicating a fairly serious illness. So the physicians ordered some tests, which is what is typical uh, that one does in this sort of a situation. And I'm, I can't show you the results of her tests. This was some time ago, but she didn't release her, her uh, information. However, I did find another patient who had a similar condition, identical condition in fact, um, identical diagnosis, it's a male, not a female. Uh, but in this case, it's going to be very similar to what Mary experienced. Now, in this particular case, this is a chest film of an individual two years before the diagnosis of this disease. And you can see here this nice white spot right here, right in the middle. And you can see these things, which are obviously ribs. And you see the light uh, areas where the ribs are and the dark areas underneath. And this is all very, very white. This is a standard x-ray. It's an old-fashioned kind of thing. They're usually using, uh, nowadays, a little bit more sophisticated, more clear pictures. Uh, but this one is clear enough. The thing about x-rays is this. When you shine x-rays through a person's body, the x-rays are absorbed by two things. They're absorbed by dense tissue, like bone, and they are absorbed by water, by fluid. So in this case, then, what you can see here is a bone, and here are the other bones sticking out like this. So these are the clavicles, and here's the sternum. You're looking at the patient facing you as if the, per the person's facing you. This light area in the inside here is not a bone. There isn't, we don't have a bone there. That's a fluid-filled sac that surrounds the heart, and that's what's absorbing the x-rays. And that area, that, that fluid-filled sac is called the pericardium. And so the heart is inside of this fluid-filled sac. Now, the lungs don't have a lot of fluid in them, typically. The lungs are, are really clear there. They've got a lot of air in them. And so the x-rays pass right through them, and so they appear dark. So in this particular case, this is not a perfect picture, but it's not bad. There's some things going on here. But for the most part, uh, this person looks uh, 
perfectly healthy. There's no indication of any pathology here that's, that's uh, particularly serious. Now we have something though. Same exact patient, two years later, this is at the time when they present with the disease, when they come in to the physician's clinic uh, with the disease. And you can see these things here are uh, EKGs. Uh, the mediastinum, or sorry, the, uh, the, the area here where the heart is, I hadn't introduced that term, uh, is still visible. But then we have this down here. Okay, so now the question is, what is this? What is this stuff here? And again, like I said, what you're looking at here is either dense tissue or fluid. And in this particular case, it, it's pretty thin, and it's not really a dense tissue. So what you're seeing here is a bunch of fluid. So there's fluid in this person's lungs, and it could be blood, it could be serous fluid, you know, or we're from the x-ray one can't tell. You actually can know what it is based on, on other evidence that's available. But if that's all you've got right here, uh, it just looks like fluid that's in, the, in, this, person's, in this person's lung. Mary's uh, diagnosis was exactly the same. So what could be causing this fluid? Well, again, when you're a physician, just like a scientist, you can't just jump to conclusions. You can't just say, oh, it must be this. You got to think through all the various things that could be happening here. One possibility is this person has a focal infection, an infection, a bacterial infection or something like that, that's causing bleeding, that's causing inflammation, and therefore it's giving you this picture. It could also be a tumor. Tumors do this too. They bleed, they cause inflammation and so forth. And so what do you have to do? You got to get in there and you've got to try to get uh, some tissue out of there. Now. Typically, when you do this kind of thing, you don't do what I'm about to show you. Uh, but what you do is you go in and you do what's called a brachial alveolar lavage, where you sort of wash up cells out of the lungs, get a look at them, see if any of them look like there's a bunch of bacteria in there or any of them look like tumor cells or whatever. Um, I'm going to show you a direct biopsy, which comes actually after uh, the, the patient had died. But here we've got something that's in the lungs. That explains her cough. What isn't explained are the tremors in her hand. We don't know why it is that she had those tremors. Now, when she had them, the physician identified those at, correctly as seizures, as minor seizures that occurred and um, indicated, again, the, the headache, the fatigue, the kinds of problems that she was having before were indicating something going on in, uh, in her cranium, in, the, in this space where her brain is. And so they ordered a, uh, a look in that area. I'm going to skip that slide. And what they found was this. And then again, this is not exactly Mary's picture. This is coming from a different patient with the exact same diagnosis. So what you're, what you're looking at here is not bone. You're looking at not fluid either, although there's probably fluid mixed up in this. This is a different kind of a scan than the one I showed you before. But what you're looking at here is, is fairly dense tissue with fluid buildup. And in fact, we also see fluid all the way out here. If you follow the cursor, you can follow it all the way around out here. And you can see there's this area looks different than this area. And that's because this uh, tumor right here, this growth is causing bleeding and, and uh, other types of fluid to build up in the brain. And that's what's causing the seizures that she's experiencing. That's what's causing the headaches. That's why they resolve when she wakes up in the morning. She stands and walks and that fluid tends to go down into the spinal column and out of the uh, central nervous system and out into the, into the lymphatic fluids. So all of this is very, very indicative of uh, a type of cancer. And so in order to determine the type of cancer, you need to get a look at the cells, get a look at the tissues. And here is an example of the kind of, of tumor that Mary was diagnosed with. This is not Mary's tumor, but it's a, another one from another patient. Now, this picture here is what the lung is supposed to look like. And these open spaces here are called alveoli. They're open air spaces. There's a very thin layer of cells there. Unfortunately, these pictures are not quite at the same scale. This is a much higher scale than this one. This is a blood vessel right here, but this is normal lung. This is relatively healthy, healthy lung. In Mary's case, what you're looking at are two big islands, one here and one here, of a type of tumor. And all of this other tissue around it here is all reactive. There's in, there's, uh, it's been infiltrated with uh, immune cells, and this is reactive, what we call stroma. It's, a, it's basically scar tissue. And it's being formed around and by this tumor. And it, these two different islands are just two different parts of the tumor. The cells here look different than the cells here. The cells here, you see this cell right here. That's a cell that's trying to be a skin cell. In fact, all of these cells here are trying to be skin cells. So... It's as if 
this tumor is trying to go to grow kind of a skin, but inside the lung. And that's a definitive characteristic of this particular type of tumor, which is called squamous cell lung cancer. Squamous cell is a flat cell, flat epithelial cell. It's a carcinoma, which means it's a tumor that comes from the epithelial type of tissues. And this is the kind of, of result that occurs when you get a tumor of that sort. Now, this particular tumor is responsible for this tumor as well. And the question is how? How is it that these tumors arise and how can a tumor in the lung and a tumor in the brain be related to each other? That is what defines this as a cancer, as a malignancy. And we're going to come back to that concept here in just a moment. But this is the situation that Mary faced. And it's quite a dire prognosis. Uh, it, it isn't a particularly uh, good situation that she has here. People who are diagnosed with this particular cancer, right? let's just start with lung cancer. We just look at lung cancer. If we have 100 people with lung cancer and modern medicine, how many of those 100 can be expected to be alive in five years okay, with the best treatment that we have? The answer to that question is on average about 14 to 15. Okay, so out of 100, with the best treatment, 14 to 15, you can expect to be alive in five years. Mary's is a particular type of cancer, squamous cell lung cancer, which has spread to her brain. And I'll define what stage that is here in a moment. Mary's prognosis is far worse. In her case, if you take 100 individuals who have exactly this diagnosis, this stage of this type of lung cancer, what proportion of them are expected to be alive in five years or what number out of 100? And the answer is between one and two. 